Welcome to the LMG webinar, Cybersecurity Budget Planning for 2021. My name is Natalie Adams, and I'm your moderator for today. Our presenters for the webinar today are Sherry Davidoff and Matt Duran. Sherry Davidoff is the CEO of LMG Security. As a recognized expert in cybersecurity and data breach response, Sherry has been called a cybersecurity badass by the New York Times. Her new book, Data Breaches, Crisis, and Opportunity is available now. Her professional experiences are featured in the book, Breaking and Entering, an extraordinary experience story of a hacker called Alien. Sherry is a GIAC certified forensic examiner and penetration tester, receiving her degree in computer science and electrical engineering from MIT. Matt Duran is the incident response team manager for LMG Security. He is an instructor at the International Black Hat USA Conference, where he teaches data breaches. A seasoned forensics professional, Matt specializes in incident response, ransomware cases, crypto jacking, and banking trojans. Matt holds a bachelor's degree in computer science from the University of Montana and previously worked as a blue team field technician and system administrator for over 10 years. His malware research has been featured on NBC Nightly News. At this time, Sherry, I'm passing you control of the webinar. Thanks so much, Natalie. So in addition to talking about your budget, it's important to make sure that your 2021 budget is going to be aligned with, your, with the current trends and priorities. Um, nobody has extra cash hanging out of their pockets these days. So we wanna make sure that you are laser focused and using your money as best you can. So Matt, why don't you talk about the attack that we saw this morning and we'll talk about how it fits into the big picture and how you wanna be focusing your cybersecurity budget in the coming year. Thanks, Sherry. So this morning we ran into a uh, a really interesting new type of cyber attack, and it's it's something that's becoming more of a trend in the industry, uh, and is one of the first times that I've really gotten to delve into one of these kind of attacks in the wild uh, without having uh, you know months old blog data or something along those lines. Uh, this morning's attack was a phishing email that was sent to a client that we're working with, and the phishing email as it arrived in the user's inbox looked pretty standard. It looked like an actual Microsoft email and was was pretty well put together. It notified the user that. Office 365 had prevented the delivery of a message and the user needed to click a link to view their quarantine file and release the message for review. And if you've used Office 365 with any of their enhanced security settings, you'll know this is a fairly common occurrence. Uh, Microsoft goes through and, and prunes out potential phishing emails for things that it has uh, medium or low confidence in the, uh, the actual phish it will provide you with a link to go in, look at those emails, and then release them from quarantine. What the user didn't see is now what you see on your screen. On the back end, when we looked at this through the eDiscovery Center and the content search, we noticed there were a number of really strange characters that were kind of embedded all throughout the text of the email. And this is referred to as a zero font attack. It's a relatively new type of attack that's meant to fool natural language processors that Office 365 uses and bypass those anti-spam and anti-phishing protection policies. So this, uh, this email didn't get caught by the spam filter. It did go directly into the user's mailbox, which is troubling when we think about uh, you know, the, the relative ease that someone was able to bypass that system. So what made this attack unique was how they actually were attempting to break into the email system. We're all familiar with basic phishing, where you're taken to a login page that, uh, you know, in most cases is not put together very well. Uh, images are blurry. It's got a strange URL. Really, the only thing that was similar to this one was the URL. Uh, the name that popped up and the uh, authentication interface that was presented to the user looked very legitimately like a Microsoft, uh, like a Microsoft authentication screen. It even included the name of the person they were attempting to fish as if, if the user was already signed in. Luckily, they made it so I could change that, so we have our own name in there. But the interesting thing about this was they're not really going exactly for your user account credentials. What they're trying to do on the back end here is register an application that can then use an OAuth token or an application password to bypass multi-factor authentication and access your uh, your information, basically steal all of your data while bypassing the security controls you have in place. And again, this is becoming a more and more frequent style of attack that we're seeing. And uh, we'll talk about it a little bit later in the presentation, but there are some really notable times where this has been very successful. 
Yeah, this really ties in with the trends that we're seeing. Number one, targeting of cloud collaboration sites like Office 365. That's huge, especially with everybody working remote. And number two, stealing those application credentials. So finding ways to bypass multi-factor authentication, um, finding ways even to bypass the human or at least to leverage the human so that they can get longer term access. So we are going to talk today about how you can spend smarter and not more. We'll specifically focus on authentication, gotchas with it when it comes to authentication and cybersecurity and then things you should be doing, application security, cloud security, important changes that you should be making to your response processes, and finally, the skills gap in cybersecurity, which is um, a fundamental challenge for every company today. But first, let's talk about how much you should be spending on cybersecurity. There is no one single number or one single percentage for every organization. Uh, unfortunately, I wish I could just say it should be 10%. Um, what we have found, though, is that, first of all, the percentage of cybersecurity budget across organizations has gone up over the years, as you might expect. And often it's measured as a percent of the IT budget or the dollars per full-time employee. Um, a recent study just released in the past couple of months by Deloitte showed that among financial institutions, the percentage of overall IT spending or the percentage of cybersecurity spend compared to the, the overall IT budget has gone up from 10.1% to 10.9%. And that means the amount of spending per full-time employee is a little over $2,600. So that's where financial institutions are sitting. If you look on the left, you can also see that as a percentage of overall revenue. So financial or related organizations, and that includes insurance and other kinds of financial firms, not just banks and credit unions. Um, the overall, uh, the percentage of overall revenue that is being spent on cybersecurity is a little under, it's 0.48%. So if you're looking to present uh, your upper management team with some rough guidelines, these are some good statistics to be citing because they are very, very current. However, how, as, as Deloitte themselves said, how a security program is planned and executed is as important, if not more important, than how much money is devoted to cybersecurity. You can spend a lot of money and not be effectively reducing your, your risk, or you can spend money in the right places and dramatically reduce your risk. So again, that's gonna be our focus today. Deloitte also found that there's three characteristics that set the most mature companies apart when it comes to cybersecurity maturity. Number one is to have leadership on board with your cybersecurity program and get the board involved as well. And we'll talk about that more in a moment. You also wanna raise cybersecurity's profile within the organization outside of IT. So conduct those awareness campaigns, make sure that you're keeping cybersecurity top of mind and align cybersecurity with your business strategy. And actually number three will help you with number Number one, if, you're, if your cybersecurity strategy is aligned with your business strategy, it's much easier to keep your executive team on board. We got a great question ahead of time. Thank you guys so much for writing in your questions, telling us what you're interested in. That was very helpful. The question was, how do you get upper management to approve your IT budget? Every organization is different. Everybody's politics are different, of course, so I don't claim to be able to solve your exact challenges, but I can tell you that you are most likely to get upper management to sign off when you are empowering your executive team, when they feel like they can make decisions, they can turn the steering wheel, they can pull the levers, and when it is their decision to accept risk. In order to do that, you have to have some clear metrics for measuring risk when it comes to cybersecurity same as we measure financial risk, you need to present that to your board and executives and give them the ability to make changes. And um, I think you'll find when your board and your executive team is faced with a decision, you have to either accept this risk, you yourself have to sign off on it, or we're going to spend a little more and address it, then they're a lot more likely to approach your budget process as a partnership and to invest. Remember, there are four ways that you can deal with risks. You can mitigate the risks, so find ways to make them better. You can avoid them to begin with. We're just not gonna have a wireless network because hackers might get into it. You can transfer that risk to third parties like a cyber insurance company. Or you can accept the risk and say, you know what, that's just a cost of doing business. We don't have the finances to invest in removing that risk. And that is a perfectly normal thing for that every organization has to do. 
So another thing to think about when you're presenting these options to your executive team or your board of directors is to uh, leverage any crises that have happened. If you have a cybersecurity incident, if there's a data breach, that is the best time for organizations to learn. So remember, don't let a good crisis go to waste. Remember to dig in, to do a post-mortem analysis. You might even want to have a third party come in, interview, and then provide a very quick report that says, here are the things you could be doing to reduce your risk going forward. Because typically, when those cybersecurity incidents are fresh in your minds or fresh in the minds of your executive team, you have a very visceral understanding of what the impact can be on your organization. And you may have a clearer idea of the impact on your wallet as well. When you're measuring uh, the return on investment for cybersecurity, again, think in terms of risk. It's a good idea to conduct a risk assessment formally, both including technical and non-technical components. And then make sure you're choosing a cybersecurity controls framework. I know a lot of people use the NIST cybersecurity framework. That is great. There's ISO 27001. There are others. But the idea of using a framework is that it allows you to compare with other organizations to provide that historical uh, glimpse into your progress over the years. And sometimes it just helps to be aligning with what a major institution has come up with. Um, you want to leverage third parties where you need to. It's funny, I think sometimes internal security teams can be um, saying the exact same thing as third party consultants, but an executive team naturally wants to know how do we stack up when compared with other organizations? You know, we want an unbiased viewpoint. So uh, it's totally appropriate to bring in a third party to do your controls assessment, to do your risk assessment, or even just present to your board. Also make sure you're including com compliance requirements, contractual requirements. If you've signed HIPAA BAs, um, if you have an examiner, make sure you're presenting those requirements to your executive team and to your board of directors as well. Cyber insurance can also be very informative because in many cases you're asking cyber insurers to take on the risk associated with potential fines or breach of laws or things like that. So you're gonna to need to demonstrate to them some minimum level of a cybersecurity program. And if you get rejected from that, that's important information for your board. Um, or if there are specific things you need to do on the application policy in order to meet their minimum standard requirements, again, that is another important consideration uh, that can have an impact on your executive team and your board as well. So again, when you're deciding how much to budget, where these funds go, we're gonna talk about the, the biggest bangs for your buck today, but make sure that you customize this for your environment. Think about your regulatory requirements, how much sensitive data you have. If there was an outage, could you weather that for a day, a week, longer than that? Um, that will impact how much like business interruption insurance you want, for example. What is the current threat landscape and how does that impact you? We're gonna dig into that in just a moment. And then what are your stakeholder expectations or your consumer expectations? If you were to have a cybersecurity incident or a data breach, that might be a bigger problem from a reputational perspective for a bank or a credit union as compared with a manufacturing organization. So all of those are things to keep in mind as you decide just what budget is correct for your organization. So Matt, want to kick us off with some of the important threats, changes to the threat landscape today that we should be considering? Oh, of course. So the, the major factors to consider when we're, we're talking about these new upgrades or new uh, changes to our cybersecurity posture and how we're, we're approaching the concept of data security and network security in a, uh, well, the, the new landscape that we're dealing with, with uh, the you know, rush to work from home and the move to cloud services is uh, to keep in mind that the potential impacts of these attacks are uh, are, are getting much much more uh, much much more heavy. Uh, there is a notable trend of high impact cyber attacks happening lately, uh, including the one that's on the screen right now. Uh, recently, we had the first really documented instance of a hospital uh, being hit with a ransomware attack, and that ransomware attack indirectly causing the death of a patient, which is an incredibly unfortunate uh, uh, unfortunate circumstance. Uh, the hospital was completely taken offline by uh, by ransomware, and the hospital actually had to stop admitting patients at this point, start redirecting them to other hospitals. One of the patients was redirected to a hospital that was farther away and unfortunately did not make the ambulance trip from the infected hospital to their new place successfully. Uh, and this, this was obviously a major issue. The interesting thing about this, the hospital itself was not actually supposed to be the target of a ransomware attack. The attackers had originally intended to go after an educational institution and had infected the hospital by mistake. 
Uh, the attackers did uh, follow the general kind of gentleman's agreement we've seen with ransomware operators since COVID-19 started, where they did provide a free decryptor for the hospital. But at that point, it was too late. And again, there are steps that the hospital could have taken ahead of time uh, and uh, security measures that the hospital could have implemented to prevent this from happening in the first place. Uh, the COVID-19 landscape has really changed how we need to uh, approach these situations, though, as is you know kind of the the natural conclusion. Uh, cybersecurity gaps and vulnerabilities due to remote work have made the security landscape completely different over the last you know six to eight months. Uh, we've seen the massive increase in remote work. We've seen the massive increase in uh, open remote access to networks. We've seen moves to cloud services, document storage, a huge number of these uh, these changes to how data is stored and how organizations are configured that have left a lot of giant gaping holes in security that really need to be filled. And when we're talking about cybersecurity budgeting, that is a major factor. We need to be able to redirect that money to now cover these these new and very, very important styles of threats. Now, it makes sense that these attacks are, are happening more frequently. Uh, ransom demands are currently skyrocketing. This is a report from uh, quarter one of 2020 from uh, a company that we work with called Codeware. And the average ransom payment right now for uh, ransomware attacks in general is about $178,000. Uh, that is a large chunk of change for a cyber criminal to extract from someone. And it can be a really big burden for a business to absorb that kind of a cost, even with the inclusion of cyber insurance. So again, yeah, taking the steps really ahead of time to, uh, to redirect, to protect your network, and to make sure these things don't happen in the first place is a major benefit and something that needs to be considered when we're thinking about how to plan out our our next year's budget, where we're putting our training money, and what we're actually including in our, uh, our security setup. So for the criminals, this is a business, and they are going after big game. It's no longer the case that they're charging 300 bucks to unlock your computer. Again, we're pushing $200,000 for an average ransom payment, and this year we have seen many multi-million dollar payment or demands. Um, so we need to treat it like a business as well and go back and measure what's the cost of a breach. You can see that um, here's the distribution of the total cost of a data breach by organizational size. And this is by number of records that have been breached. Um, oh, sorry. This is, uh, I apologize. Uh, that's measured in millions of dollars. So for small businesses, the average cost can be over $2 million. Once you get a very large business, like 25, over 25,000 people or more, you're talking four or $5 million. Um, so this is a very significant cost, which again, you might wanna consider when you're planning your budgets. Again, what is that ROI? This is the cost per record that I was looking for a moment ago. So if you have customer PII, that is gonna be the most expensive type of data to lose at $150 per record. This is from IBM's recent cost of a breach report. Other corporate data just kind of lumped together is almost as expensive, $149 per record. General intellectual property, $147 per record. Um, and then you get down, even anonymized customer data costs $143 per record, because you still have to go back through that and figure out, was it really anonymized? Is there anything that we missed redacting? Um, employee PII, which wasn't even on the map a decade ago, is now $141 per record. And here's the different ways that a breach impacts your organization. Lost business uh, makes up about 40% of the cost of a breach. The process of detection and escalation is about 28.8%. Notification costs can be 6.2%. A lot of times those are covered by insurance. And then the process after the response, ex post response, is over a quarter of the cost. Um, that's interesting because a lot of times when you're producing reports for upper management, it is before the dust has really settled on a breach. So it's important to go back, you know, a year later, two years later, and continue to update those costs. Sometimes lawsuits after a breach can take years to settle. So again, we're talking about how uh, it's a business and the criminals are after big game. They are really figuring out how to maximize their own return on investment. And we got a sneak peek into how criminal organizations operate when it came to the Tesla attacks. So Matt and I recently did a podcast, um, which was published this week about the Tesla attacks and how a Russian cyber criminal gang was attempting to install malware on Tesla's network. There were a couple interesting points about this. One, they were attempting to um, 
use an insider in order to place the malware within Tesla's organization. So they had identified a potentially sympathetic employee ahead of time, someone who was a Russian speaking employee. They reached out to that employee, they wined him and dined him, took him on a vacation in Tahoe. And then late one night they said, we have a special project we'd like you to work on. And they proposed that the employee infect Tesla's network with malware, which would allow the group to steal uh, their data. They were gonna give that employee originally $500,000, which they ended up bumping up to a million dollars. In this case, the employee reported it to Tesla who brought in the FBI, but what would your employees do? It really gets to the heart of um, how impactful insider attacks can be and how important employee loyalty is. And also making sure that you know who your employees know who to report these things to and that you have a good response program. But anyway, we can see how much money the Russian cyber criminal gang was investing in this. It was just a million dollars for that employee. And then the agents themselves reportedly got a cut. They were investing $250,000 in custom written malware for Tesla's network. They were planning on a ransom demand of four to six million dollars. So this is a business. This is a profitable enterprise that we need to be defending against. The same is true, not just sure, in really ransomware. Cool. Yep, go ahead, Matt. Oh, uh, one of the things that uh, a lot of people haven't talked about with Tesla that, that I think is really interesting is the uh, the cost to Tesla of this of this attempted cyber attack. I mean, when we see the headlines about it, we think Tesla stopped the cyber attack. The FBI got involved. Everything was was taken care of before anything actually went wrong. Uh, buried in the complaint was the actual cost that Tesla uh, associated with the just the specter of this attack happening. Once Tesla learned of this attack, they went ahead and proactively invested $20,000 of additional money into their cybersecurity uh, controls for this specific facility for anti-denial of service protection. So even though the attack never actually happened, it still cost them $20,000. Hmm. Uh, well, thanks for that addition. That's helpful information. Uh, it's always better. An ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. It's always better to invest ahead of time. And Tesla really dodged a bullet in this case. So in addition to ransomware and other types of malware attacks, we're seeing business email compromise scams absolutely surging this year. And I think there's a number of factors to that. Number one, a lot of people working from home, um, there's not as much communication. There's also these very new types of software that people are using. A lot of folks are using Zoom for the first time or maybe certain features of Office 365 that they've never used. And so they're more easily tricked by some of these phishing emails that are capitalizing on remote work. But we have also seen Russian cyber criminal gangs uh, starting to dip their toes into business email compromise. Cosmic Links is the threat that came out in July. They're a new group that is targeting business email compromise. And these are very sophisticated scams. Um, they're multi-component. Often they're targeting specific people, learning everything they can about your organization. Uh, they will, once they get into one person's email, they will monitor it. Like let's say they get into one person within a financial group in your organization. They'll monitor it. They'll understand what people are working on and find the right time to get in that conversation so that they can redirect a payment. So very sophisticated, very high return on investment, and also very damaging for you potentially. We don't see a whole lot of banks and credit unions that announce data breaches these days. And it's telling that we saw one just this month, Texel Credit Union down in Texas reported a data breach. Um, it was a employee email account apparently that got hacked because of a stolen password. And even if you tell your employees, hey, don't put sensitive information in your email, don't keep customer data or member data there, you, it's very hard to prevent members and customers from sending you their information. So often you end up with sensitive information in email anyway. So very damaging from a reputational perspective and I'm sure from an investigative perspective. It's not surprising that the federal, the FBI actually put out a notification just this month about credential stuffing attacks. So many billions of passwords have been stolen and leaked these days. They're just out there on the dark web. Um, that criminals are literally just taking passwords, reusing them wherever they can in work email, in your online banking, in your shopping sites. Uh, so your customers may have had, if you have customers or members, uh, they may have had their accounts hacked. 41% of the total incidents, according to the FBI, are due to credential stuffing attacks, which can result in loss of customers, downtime, reputational damage, you name it. 
The other interesting thing that was buried in this notification is that many criminals are targeting application programming interfaces, APIs, because they're less likely to require multi-factor authentication. When you think about it, it's really obvious. If you may have multi-factor authentication turned on in your email, and that's awesome. Run, don't walk. If you don't have that turned on, do it right after this presentation. Um, but the criminals realize, hey, uh, when you check your email using software on your computer, you're not constantly entering that two-factor authentication. It's only in the web interface. Applications have special application passwords or tokens which can be stolen, and the criminals are starting to target that, and it has not made the news nearly enough. So again, we've talked about the fact that there are billions of compromised credentials available for sale on hacker forums. Uh, this is just, again, just from July, there was yet another study. In the Verizon Data Breach Investigations Report, we found that they found that the top threat actions are number one, phishing, and number two, use of stolen credentials. And a lot of times criminals are doing both. They're phishing, they're getting your usernames and passwords, and then they're logging in with them. So what do you do to defend against it? Deploy multi-factor authentication. If you are looking for the number one bang for your buck, this is it. Make sure you have MFA turned on, on your email, on your cloud sites, everywhere you can. Remember, multi-factor to authenticate means to verify someone's identity. And we do that using something you know, something you have, or something you are. When we talk about multi-factor authentication, we just mean using more than one method of verifying someone's identity. Because so many passwords have been stolen, you cannot rely on them anymore. So these apps on your phone are a great way to do it. There are ways that are not great for deploying two-factor authentication. We have weaker methods of 2FA that you're gonna wanna avoid if you can. And again, it's not very expensive to turn off weak two-factor authentication, but it will dramatically improve your security posture. For example, text messages are a much less secure method of, do, of doing two-factor authentication. So let's say you go to log into your email, you get a pin to your phone, the, there are a couple problems with this. Number one, we've seen cases where criminals are uh, calling people up and saying, hey, tell me your code, um, and then they break into your email. Or they might make a fake phishing website that just says, okay, enter the code from your, authentication, from your authenticator app, and then boom, they're in. Uh, but we've also seen a rash of SIM jacking attacks where criminals pretend they call up your uh, telecommunications provider or maybe one for an executive. They pretend that they that you have a new phone and then they redirect your phone number to their phone so that they then receive your pins. We've been seeing a surprising number of those. So wherever you can, turn off SMS as an option so criminals can't even fall back to that. Sometimes you may have your employees using an authenticator app, but there's um, Microsoft is a great example. They'll say, would you like to sign in another way? And then you can choose text message based authentication. So wherever you can turn off week to FA and deploy a password manager. I no longer think password managers are just there to remember people's passwords. We need people to be using password managers to generate unique passwords. And that's something you need to include in your training because otherwise what is to stop your employees from using the same password on their social media accounts as they use on work? Maybe they'll add a couple numbers or an exclamation point. The criminals can figure that out. So deploying a password manager is another uh, very uh, high bang for your buck thing that you can invest in and make it available to your whole team. Some options here I have on the screen. So LastPass, Dashlane, OnePassword, those are just some examples of popular and widely used password managers. They're typically about three to four dollars per user per month, um, which again, every I know everything adds up, but it's typically within the realm of what small to mid-sized businesses can afford. If you do have a larger organization, you should be able to get a bulk discount on that. Also, talk to your insurance company because some insurers are offering discounts for two-factor authentication or for password managers. Along those lines, it is so critically important to centrally manage your authentication. This is another really important budget priority. Think about all the different cloud websites that you use, all the different people you need to give access to from employees to vendors, you, you name it. It's very important to integrate your cloud applications together because so much of our data is in the cloud. And it's 
easier to, to deploy multi-factor authentication if you're using a system like this. So Duo and Okta are two big market leaders. This will allow you to um, not only deploy two-factor two authentication, but also to restrict access based on device. So if you don't want people using your, their personal devices, or if you want them only using certain devices, you can do that. You can have it block and detect suspicious logins. You can have it do single sign-on, so it's all synchronized across many different applications. So again, this is one that I would absolutely make a budget priority for 2021. It will dramatically reduce your risks of getting ransomware, business email compromise, and other types of hacks. Don't forget about your community, your customers, your members. Just uh, recently, in fact, September 18th, just this week, there was an announcement that Dunkin' Donuts settled the data breach lawsuit. And this wasn't hackers that had broken into Dunkin' Donuts itself. Um, they were targeting customer accounts. Many customers had their accounts hacked. Um, they had their Dunkin' Donuts cards taken, um, points that could be used to purchase goods were stolen from them. And according to the lawsuit, Dunkin' Donuts knew that customer accounts were being targeted, in some cases hacked. They could see the attacks going on. They didn't do anything about it. And of course, you always have this balance. You don't want to annoy your customers or your members, but you also need to make sure that your accounts are, that their accounts have a reasonable level of security. So make sure that you are offering at least an option of two-factor authentication for your customers. It is time, guys. Um, so make it available so that if they want it, they can take advantage of that. And turn on monitoring. Make sure you're monitoring customer logins and not just your employee logins so that you can detect when there's a problem. All right, Matt, you wanna talk about this one? Yeah, I, I think this is a, a really good kind of lead in to the, uh, the, the sheer volume of uh, cloud applications and uh, you know, other types of applications that are being used by businesses right now. Uh, the, the big thing with Duncan was that uh, the, the uh, passwords and information were stolen because of a vulnerability in a third party application. And uh, due to hard-coded credentials and some other things that we won't dive too deep into at this point, uh, attackers were able to get that. But it, it brings up an interesting point. We really do need to inventory log on interfaces and know exactly what it is that we're using for all the services in our in our daily business. Uh, things like our software as a service offerings, like Office 365 and Slack and G Suite, our uh, our you know infrastructure as a service, like Amazon EC2 or uh, Azure or things along those lines. Uh, there are a ton of different uh, services that we use at this point. And it's really important that we know exactly what those are and what the available security functions are for each one of them, because they're all going to be a little bit different. And as Sherry and pointed out before, I mean, if we have the opportunity to drop multi-factor authentication in on one of these, I mean, it, it makes complete sense to do that. Yeah, and Matt, I love, this sure. image you picked. Yeah. I love this image you picked because it's overwhelming, the number of cloud applications on there. And most organizations are using far more cloud applications than you may even realize. Once you start interviewing people, you'll be like, oh my God, marketing is using this and sales is using that. And it really starts to add up. But uh, don't feel too overwhelmed. The first thing to remember is that you can prioritize. So you don't have to tackle all of these at once, but you should be making an informed decision about what interfaces you're going to tackle first. Um, so make sure that you know what you're using and then pick the top ones. Okay, we're going to target QuickBooks in the cloud or we're going to target Office 365. We're going to lock down access to that. We're going to centralize it and then move on to your next highest priorities. So prioritize and go from there. Exactly. Um, so the, we have seen a huge shift in the use of the cloud over the past year, and you can see that in this graph by IDG. This just came out. So which statement best describes your organization's total IT environment, and then which describes it 18 months from now? So this gives us a good picture of where we're going. There has been a huge shift to the cloud, and that is only going to continue. Um, and we've seen the potential impact of cloud breaches just this summer in the case of BlackBot. I wish you guys were here in person so we could do a show of hands. In fact, just raise your hand, it's good to stretch. If you were impacted by the BlackBot breach, this is another breach that Matt and I talked about in the recent Breaking Breaches podcast, which you can find on YouTube. But BlackBot is um, a company that serves a huge number of nonprofits and associations and even for-profit companies around the world. The purpose of the BlackBot cloud software is to help with fundraising, track donors, things like that. 
one out of three Fortune 500 companies uses BlackBot. So when they were hit with ransomware, that affected a lot of people. Not only did it take down their service, it also meant that the criminals had access to um, pot potentially to some customer information. They, BlackBot said that they paid the cyber criminals demand um, and that the criminals said that they deleted the data. So that has left a lot of people in limbo. Do you report? Do you not report? We have seen hundreds of organizations that are affected by the BlackBot hack. And remember, every single organization that uses BlackBot has to do their own investigation because cloud providers are not tracking what data you're storing in their system. BlackBot has come out and said, oh, social security numbers were stolen or that certain fields were encrypted and the hackers couldn't get access to them. But it all depends on data entry. How are you using the system? Do you have people putting sensitive information in the notes field or in a different field? So all these different organizations have had to do their own investigation, figure out exactly what, what data is in BlackBot, what their notification requirements are. And we've seen this steady stream of notifications coming out across uh, throughout the summer. And also a steady stream of non-notifications. I can tell you from within the forensics communi community that some organizations have chosen not to investigate or not to notify, in part because of BlackBot's claim that the criminals deleted the data. This has affected all kinds of organizations, from universities um, to the Boy Scouts to nonprofits, not just in the United States, but all around the world. And the multi-million dollar question is exactly what information was affected. Um, some people said it involves donor details, including car license information, wealth, identified assets, things that make people a, a greater target going forward. What, what are your interests? What were your interests in college, for example? And then there's uh, organizations like uh, Detroit Mercy, for example, that was storing names and social security numbers. So again, the the impact on the broader um, community has been huge. So think about your supply chain risks. It's kind of scary to think about what happens if Microsoft has a breach? What happens if Amazon has a breach? And then there are these smaller organizations, um, or they're still large, that are providing cloud services like BlackBot that can still be very impactful. So know what cloud providers you use and what data you store in each. Doing this kind of inventory is time consuming, it's labor intensive, it's not the same thing as buying some fancy security box, but it will absolutely help you manage your risk. And this is something I would prioritize in the coming year. If you have a supplier that suspects a breach, are they gonna notify you? Is it gonna take three, four, five months? If they do, what kind of evidence will you have access to? And are they collecting evidence in the first place so that you could rule things out? And finally, know who covers the cost. If one of your cloud providers got breached, who has to pay for that forensic investigation and who has to pay for the notification? Again, it can seem overwhelming when you think about all your different cloud providers, but prioritize. Think about the types of information you handle and where that is stored. I would interview your team because there may be some surprises in there. There almost certainly are when you're trying to map your data. And then pick your top few cloud providers to really focus on in the coming months. The bottom line is control your cloud data. Again, do that inventory, control what you store in each cloud app. These could be technical controls, but a lot of times it's just policy, reminding people what is okay to store in the cloud and what is not. A really big thing that happens is sometimes people need to, for example, transfer files and your organization may not have a secure file transfer program available. And so they upload it to like Dropbox or to their own Google account. It's hard to prevent that. One of the best things you can do is to invest in cloud apps that your employees do need. So give them a place that you manage to share files or to do whatever it is that, that they need to be doing in the cloud. So that way you are at least in control. And finally, make sure that you're auditing the cloud. Go in and check once in a while. What are we storing in BlackBot? Do we have social security numbers in there? And then move on. So speaking of the supply chain, do you wanna tell us about Dave, Matt? Oh, I would love to tell you about Dave. So some of you may be aware of what Dave is. Uh, for those that aren't, Dave is a payday lending application that was uh, kind of a, a big splash in the uh, new trend in smaller personal banking that's been that's been happening over the last few years. And they were uh, bankrolled by Mark Cuban. There was a big, uh, big kind of celebration when they came out because of this 
new kind of revolutionary service they were offering. Uh, recently, Dave had to admit a security breach that impacted seven and a half million users uh, of, their, of their service. And the interesting thing about this was Dave was not directly responsible for this breach happening. Uh, they were doing all of their, uh, uh, you know, all the, or they were taking all the right steps. They were managing their security properly on their end. The mistake they made was moving into a third-party vendor for services. They were using a company called Waydev, and Waydev is a company that can track uh, programming analytics and basically keep track of the developers that are working for the company uh, to make sure that work is getting done on time, to make sure that things are being done efficiently, and basically just to make sure that everyone is doing what they say they're doing on the on the back end. The issue was Waydev suffered a compromise, and Waydev had access to the source code for Dave, uh, and they were given access using what's referred to as an OAuth token, and we, we talked about those a little bit earlier, but they're essentially application or machine passwords that are used by a number of applications to communicate with a bunch of different services that someone might be using. In this case, it was GitHub and GitLab. Using that OAuth token, attackers were able to bypass any kind of authentication safeguards that were in place and directly access the raw data on the back end of the Dave database. Uh, and they were actually able to, to access other companies as well, although which other companies those were has not really been made clear at this point. I'm sure we'll hear more about it uh, you know, as we move forward since this is still pretty recent. But it points to a bigger issue, and that is the, the vetting of your providers. Um, Dave made a couple of good steps though. When they were storing their data, they did encrypt the, uh, the bank account numbers that people were using at rest in their database, meaning that if someone took the database, they could not directly access that information. The parts that they didn't encrypt, however, were things like names, addresses, phone numbers, mother's maiden names, and a lot of other potentially sensitive data. Um, and this is really what, uh, what kind of spurred that, uh, that notice that they had to put out telling everyone that they had been breached. There was a number of, uh, of personal items that were accessed in this case. Uh, but it brings up a really interesting concept, and that is the, the concept of encryption at rest when you're storing your data in a cloud service or in a, uh, in a database that's accessible potentially by someone else. Uh, most cloud providers at this point do offer encryption at rest services. So SharePoint and OneDrive both offer it. Dropbox encryption is, uh, is top notch. Google Drive encryption is available, but a lot of these features aren't enabled by default. And in some cases, there are add-on packages that need to be purchased to be able to actually access these features. Um, normally, they're not that much though. So the, the uh, balance between cost and security uh, really becomes a uh, you know a pretty reachable goal in a lot of these situations. I mean, it's it's probably worth your time and worth the little bit of extra investment to make sure that that data is safe in the event that someone else accesses it through whatever means they might. Well, Matt, I love the idea that you just pointed out time because honestly, I think that is the number one barrier that gets in the way right now is security teams not having the time to see. Uh, what kinds of features you have access to. Again, like you said, these are often low cost, in some cases even free. You can flip them on and then if a breach happens, well, it, or if the criminals get into your systems, you may not have to report that. So, and also you, to your point from earlier, you have to think about not just your suppliers, but their suppliers and then their suppliers' suppliers. So all of this risk just trickles down. And the more you can do to encrypt your data so that you don't have to worry about it in this whole big supply chain or supply web, the better off you'll be. So there was another breach back in August that was announced by the SANS Institute. And Matt, I know that this, again, if you're seeing a trend, it is application, it's, it's targeting applications and the interfaces that applications use. Do you wanna cover this one too, Matt? Oh yeah, I'll take this one. So uh, SANS is is noted for their expertise on uh, on cybersecurity. In fact, they they teach a lot of people about cybersecurity. So when it was, uh, when it was released that uh, SANS had suffered a data breach where someone was able to access files and emails that were stored within their cloud systems. It made uh, it made a lot of people kind of take notice. Uh, and the interesting thing about the SANS uh, the SANS compromise was that SANS did have multi-factor authentication enabled. Now we we showed you the uh, the uh, phishing email that we had received just today from one of our clients. It was this same kind of attack that actually affected SANS. Uh, one of their users did click on a phishing email and was taken to a page asking for uh, authentication with their credentials and then the uh, acceptance of a use of an application. This application is then able to kind of go in on the back end and uh, bypass all those multi-factor authentication controls and directly access certain portions of the data. So by taking this route, 
the attackers didn't have to worry about the, the extra security layers that were in place. They were essentially able to slip under the radar, uh, grab the data in its raw form, and just walk straight out the door with it, which was, which was really troubling. But again, this isn't really anything that uh, it, we're seeing as kind of a one-off. This is a, you know, a, a trend that we're seeing. Stolen tokens, broken authentication, uh, credential theft, and security misconfigurations are huge. Uh, the uh, graphic you see on the screen here shows a report from Gartner. By 2021, 90% of web-enabled applications will have more surface area for attack. And they're talking about exposed APIs, these application program interfaces. And this is huge for a lot of people as more and more companies are moving to these cloud-based applications instead of on-premise applications to fulfill basically their daily roles. So what can we do about this and what can we do to, to keep this from happening becomes a, you know, a, a very valid question to ask. Well, what can the we solutions do are there. And effective. Exactly, what can we do that, that is already pretty much available to us, we just need to invest a little bit of time to make sure that this is functioning properly. Uh, so what you see here is a shot of the uh, Microsoft Azure application authorization screen. In a lot of cases, uh, developers will, uh, will configure applications to access certain parts of the system. What we really need to do is verify that these applications are accessing what they need to and not accessing things that they don't need access to. And a lot of this can be found just in the key management sections that are already included in Azure and in a number of other cloud tenants, but are often overlooked when we come to security audits because they are kind of black magic to a lot of people. Um, but uh, again, uh, the taking a little bit of extra time to, uh, to audit these things, to evaluate what exactly you're providing access to, can save you a ton of headache down the road. And it's a relatively inexpensive or, again, sometimes free uh, feature to, to take advantage of. Yeah, and if you rush to use the cloud or maybe even just set it up a couple of years ago, you may find that your users uh, have the ability to give access to third party apps. Oh, I want to install Zoom, I want to install this or, or another thing that's useful. And that can be very helpful, but it means that every single employee has the power to um, allow transfer of potentially of your data or of permissions to a third party organization. So simply by taking the time to go through and restrict that default user access, really take a hard look at how third party apps are configured. You can, again, dramatically reduce your risk with just by using tools that you probably already have access to. So speaking of which, in the cloud, there are a ton of security features that we find most organizations are not taking full advantage of. So I know that, that is includes, absolutely true. <laughs> sorry, this is like a part of that. You're always in our systems looking at the DLP and advanced threat protection. And I know you oh, yeah. see in every case, you tell people to turn it on. Um, so you want to explain to oh, us yeah. what we're missing in a lot of cases? Yeah, of course. And again, yeah, these, these features are available uh, by default in a lot of your kind of out of the box cloud secure cloud application solutions or just cloud solutions in general. Uh, things like the ability to add multi-factor authentication, which if you're using something like Office 365 is a free feature. All you have to do is click a box to turn it on. It's really that easy. And then the, even the applications to use uh, multi-factor authentication are free. Uh, it's available in the App Store or in the, uh, in the Google market for, for no cost whatsoever. It takes about five minutes to set up and then you're good to go. You've got this really nice extra layer of security. Data loss prevention is a huge one, making sure that you're not, uh, you're not losing sense of data or that you're at least alerted, where, where it's, uh, or alerted to where it's stored. Uh, intrusion detection, intrusion prevention, advanced threat protection is a huge one. If you've got uh, Office 365 uh, E5, there are a veritable smorgasbord of features that you could be uh, enabling on your tenant to stop things like phishing, to stop things like spam, to stop domain spoofing uh, that are all there, but a lot of them just aren't turned on by default. So again, taking that extra little bit of time and making sure your employees are trained and able to, uh, to interact with these tools is, is super important and is well worth your while going down the road. Uh, we, also include, uh, we also influence people to turn up their logging and monitoring to whatever the maximum capacity might be. Uh, logging and monitoring is built into most of these applications, uh, so things like CloudTrail or the you know, Audit Center for Office 365. And then the analytics tools to actually look at this and store this are most of the time very low cost, open source, or free. Uh, there are paid solutions out there that are very good, but just because, they, uh, just because you want to be able to analyze these things doesn't mean you need to drop a ton of money into them. Things like the Elkstack and Kibana or Greylog uh, are, are great tools for these. Um, retention times are also important to keep in mind, make sure those are cranked up to their maximum. Things like uh, Office 365 for E3, you get 90 days. For E5, you get a year, but you need to make sure it's configured that way. And then more importantly, we need to make sure that we're centralizing all this data. 
I have a spot where when you need to go and look at what's actually happening in your in your cloud tenants and uh, your your cloud applications, you've got an easy place that a security specialist can drop into, uh, basically one shot for all of the data and look at what's happening. They don't need to look around, they don't need to search for things, and they're good to go. Yep. So make sure. So that you're investing in cloud configuration reviews becomes really really important. And Sherry, do you want to talk about this one? Yeah, sure. I mean, just to drive the point home, we see so many breaches happening because of misconfigurations. If you look at this image, this is from the Verizon Data Breach Investigations Report. Simple misconfigurations are on the rise and you just need to check for them. So it's an investment of time checking your new shiny new cloud systems or even some of your older ones, um, finding those misconfigurations before they turn into breaches, finding those logging issues before you really need that logging. And remember, in order to do this, you need to have an inventory of what cloud applications you're actually using and prioritizing them. Um, enable those security features that you may not be taking advantage of, and then uh, look at the authentication policies. Are you allowing eight character, very simple passwords, or are you requiring longer passwords, or are you requiring two-factor authentication? If you're looking for some resources, the Center for Internet Security has some great benchmarks. Here's one example of um, their benchmark for securing Google's cloud computing platform. It is freely available. Again, take advantage. It's an investment of time more than anything else. If you're curious, um, the average security spending does vary by size. Um, According to a recent report by the, uh, based on FSISAC members, small organizations are spending about 12% of their IT budget on cybersecurity, whereas midsize and large, it's only 9%. So we are gaining some economies of scale. Um, on the flip side, large organizations are spending about $2,700 per full-time employee, whereas small ones are only spending about $2,100. So finally, again, we know that cybersecurity incidents happen, breaches happen, and how you respond is 99%. It will impact how much damage there is, what the reputational cost is, even how much the investigation costs. Um, there have been some big changes in best practices for response this summer. One of the big, um, one of the big news st stories is that Uber's former security chief, Joseph Sullivan, is charged with covering up a data breach because they did not announce the breach in a timely manner. And according to the court documents, he may not have um, been transparent about the breach, even to uh, Uber's new CEO. We haven't really heard the counter arguments to this yet, um, and so the case is still unfolding. But there are concerns, um, even just this month, Gar Gartner came out and warned that CEOs may be personally liable for breaches within the next decade. So let's dig into that Uber breach and talk about what happened and how you can avoid being the next Uber. So when they, when Uber was breached, uh, criminals came in, stole some information. Matt's gonna go into the technical details here in just a moment. Um, they, uh, the hackers demanded a ransom. And they paid the ransom. The hackers confirmed that they deleted the stolen data. We'll get to that in a second. And so Uber said, okay, great. We don't have to notify anybody. A couple of years later, when they were doing an internal audit, um, a higher up found the odd payment, dug into it, and they eventually announced that breach. It turned out 50 million riders' information was stolen, 7 million drivers, including driver's license numbers. And even though the criminals um, said at the time that they had deleted the information. After the fact, they admitted um, to investigators that they had also given that information to a third party and they didn't know if that person deleted it or not. And that's very common. You can't trust criminals. I would think that goes without saying. One of the big things that would have helped the CISO of, US, of Uber and Uber as a whole would have been involving outside counsel. Now, we don't know for a fact exactly what happened internally yet. The details are still coming out. But one thing I've noticed reading through the court documents is that they don't talk about Uber having pulled in outside counsel to get a third party review of this. And if they had, I suspect that third party, like that law firm, outside, an experienced data breach attorney would have said, mm, you probably want to notify in this case. Or if the experienced uh, outside counsel had said, you don't need to notify and here's why, they would have a nicely written up letter and an exclamation, an explanation that they could point to um, that, would, that would remove the burden of that decision from their inside team. So it's always good to use outside counsel whenever you can and be as transparent as you can. 
But again, this was an application token theft. If you were catching a theme, this is it. Um, by the way, I know we're running a little close on time. If you have questions, please let us know. Uh, we will stick around for a few minutes afterwards. Uh, we are coming up to the end here. Um, so Matt, do you wanna dig into the application token theft to help us wrap up? Yeah, of course. So uh, as we've uh, hammered on quite a bit in this presentation, uh, Uber's original data breach was just basically because of poor programming hygiene and, and uh, you know, some some lapses in uh, security practices on their back end. Uh, in this case, the code that they were using to run their applications actually had the uh, the keys and access credentials that you would need to access the storage that was holding all this user information hard coded directly into the program code itself. So once hackers realized this, they literally just had to copy and paste those codes out and that gave them full access to the, uh, the S3 buckets and uh, all of the repos that were holding all of their customer data in clear text. And it was really not a difficult thing for the attackers to do. Now, uh, Uber actually quit using uh, GitHub for their in-house code repository after this breach because that's where the, uh, where the attackers actually got this from. But they also had to admit that they didn't have multi-factor authentication on the repositories that were uh, that included those AWS credentials. So they they had all this uh, really really potentially sensitive data or the means to access it sitting there without that extra layer of protection or protection. And in this case, having multi-factor authentication on that repo probably would have stopped this. But it brings us up to the the overall kind of theme that we're looking at. We need to make sure that the applications we're using are vetted and are done properly. We don't want hard-coded tokens. Uh, we don't want credential leaks included in the source code. We want expiration times on the tokens that are being used to access our applications. Otherwise, we run into data loss problems. Now, the issue here is that this does become quite a bit of work, but the, uh, the the basics that we have to keep in mind is that these are essentially passwords. I mean, treating security tokens as you would treat passwords is basically the attitude that we have to have. Uh, these are means to access your system by bypassing all other all other all other methods of uh, authentication. So if we're not keeping those secure, then we're really just kind of leaving the door open at that point. Yep. The other thanks, Matt. The other big thing that happened this summer was the Capital One ruling. This impacts everybody. In the case of Capital One, of course, they experienced a breach, uh, was it a little over a year ago? Um, and they accidentally revealed uh, millions of people's sensitive personal information on, a, on Amazon. It was stored in the cloud. This resulted in lawsuits. And as part of that lawsuit, a judge ruled this summer that Capital One had to turn over their forensic report to opposing counsel. And that is um, devastating for uh, cases all throughout the country because when you do a forensic analysis, you hope that that will not get into the hands of opposing counsel. <clears throat> Usually the way that this is done is by protecting it under attorney-client privilege or as work product. And um, Capital One did engage outside counsel hoping that that would be the case. But the judge ruled that there were a few problems with the way that they, that they engaged their forensics team that made it so that the forensic data breach report was discoverable. Number one, they hired that forensics team before the breach happened. They had them on retainer. And that can be fine. There can be ways to manage that. But in this case, they used the same contract, the same language uh, for the actual breach investigation that they do um, for just their retainer itself. And so the judge felt that um, it was clear that Mandiant was not hired, quote, in anticipation of litigation, which is what you need to do in order to protect that report. Also, it was paid for out of the business budget and not out of the legal budget. And that report was shared with regulators and not just with legal counsel. So again, there was a lot of evidence that it was not done in anticipation of litigation. So there are some changes that you should be looking at making. And by the way, it was they had a separate ruling here late August that they don't have to hand over their PwC report on the cloud hack. So again, there's just a few little differences in the way that you engage your forensic investigators can make a very big difference. Um, so make sure that you are paying for it out of your legal budget, that you have a custom written statement of work that's specific to that incident, and that you are you have a statement of work just for that incident, and it specifically references that you're doing this in anticipation of litigation. Those are some things you can do um, to help protect uh, your organization in the event of an incident. 
Also remember, now that so many people are working remotely, you have to really take a close look at your incident response procedures. Do you have uh, changes that you need to make to your processes to handle an incident remotely? How are you going to get a hold of people? If your network is down, do you have all the information you need? A study earlier this year found that only 51% of cybersecurity teams are highly confident in their ability to detect and respond to cyber threats during the pandemic. And now that the pandemic is stretching on and on and on, you really need to think about this. So review and update your response processes. Make sure you're engaging an experienced outside attorney, paying for forensics out of your legal budget, taking the steps that we discussed, and preparing for a remote response. And finally, to wrap things up, um, one of the fundamental, probably the most fundamental thing that is blocking security teams today is the skills gap. Cybersecurity moves so fast, and now that so many organizations have raced to the cloud, we need to make sure that the folks in charge of actually doing the boots on the ground cybersecurity know how to use these systems. All of these security features that organizations are not taking advantage of, um, they're available. It's just that the it's just that security team members don't necessarily know how to activate them or that they're there in the first place. So 72% of people surveyed by Cybrary admitted that skill gaps exist. Um, and 65% of IT managers say that these skill gaps hurt their effectiveness. The great thing is there is low cost security training available. And in some cases, it doesn't even take very much time. So Amazon offers a whole security learning path that you can use. Microsoft offers a security administrator associate certificate, and you can take the classes freely online. It costs less than 200 bucks to get that certification. So look at the types of cloud systems that you're using and then come up with a training program for your IT staff and your security teams so that they specifically understand how to secure those systems. Along those lines, um, by the way, at LMG, we are up offering a cyber first responder class. It's designed to be a low cost, one day boot camp on how to handle cybersecurity incidents. We cover ransomware incidents, cloud incidents. Uh, we do hands-on labs for hard drive imaging, volatile evidence collection, network-based evidence. That is coming up on November 5th. Seems pretty relevant, so I figured I'd let you guys know. Uh, check out our website to sign up. So to summarize, here's how you get the most bang for your buck in 2021. Make sure you're focusing on authentication. Deploy multi-factor authentication and deploy it where you need it. Make sure you know what cloud systems are available and turn on MFA where you can. That's the single most effective thing you can do. Make sure that you're centrally managing authentication and pay attention to any applications um, that may have access to your system. So restrict third-party apps. And if you are, have any kind of uh, development, make sure that you're protecting and rotating your application tokens. Make sure when it comes to cloud security that you're controlling your cloud data and take advantage of those cloud security features. Crank up your logging, your monitoring, do those cloud configuration reviews. A lot of times this is just an investment of time more than anything else. And that's what we need to be doing right now. And finally, invest in practical, low cost security training this year that is specifically tailored to your environment. And with that, we'll take questions for a couple minutes. Thank you, Sherry and Matt. We had a few questions that came up from our audience during the presentation. The first one is what should the priority be when it comes to new cybersecurity spending and what areas should we focus on? Yeah, great question. So um, as we talked about, you wanna really focus on authentication and on investing time. So uh, make sure that you have security folks that are reviewing your cloud configurations, restricting access to applications. You can either do that in-house or you can outsource it. I know that's something that Matt has done quite a bit of this year. Um, Matt, anything you wanna to add to that? No, no, I think you pretty much nailed it. I mean, the, the big things that we're looking for as a, as kind of a priority are, I mean, take care of these low or, uh, these these low effort, high impact things first. I mean, getting multi-factor in place, making sure you've got a good password policy in place, making sure that you've got just your basic security features enabled and up and running uh, can go a really, really long way towards that, that uh, big jump into a secure infrastructure that everybody needs. We can handle the more complicated things as we move down the road, but things that take a few minutes to implement uh, are kind of a no-brainer at that point. Great, thank you. The next question is, if hackers can bypass multi-factor authentication, is it still worth using? 
Absolutely. They will go for the low hanging fruit. If you don't turn on MFA, you end up like that credit union having to announce a breach because your email was compromised. Multi-factor authentication will absolutely stop a huge percentage of the attacks. And criminals are still finding ways around it, um, but it's going to be your first line of defense. I'd agree with that. Yeah. I mean, we, we like to look at security in, uh, in the, the cybersecurity landscape in general as uh, you know, kind of layers, kind of, you know, like an onion. Uh, so having those independent layers of security, having multi-factor, having strong passwords, having intrusion detection, having all those things working together to protect your environment is uh, is going to be your best bet. I mean, there's no one silver bullet that's going to stop a hacker from getting in. It's about putting up those blocks and making sure there are so many obstacles in place that they they really can't get by all of them. Great. Thank you for explaining that. The last question we have is, is it worth it to have a third party manage security devices? There is at least worth looking into. If you're talking about things like firewall configuration or, or cloud service configuration, I mean, those are things that your general IT staff may not be currently trained to handle. And it's not to say that they can't be brought up to speed on them and they can't be, uh, you know, educated in a way that would allow them to to take over that kind of responsibility but for dropping in new hardware if there are questions about the security features how it operates or how it should be configured investing in uh, some third-party help to get that up and going and make sure it's configured right off the bat I think is, is really really probably worth your while yeah, absolutely. I would con concur um, because it takes so much time and effort to specialize in a certain type of technology. I would leverage third parties where you can. And there have been studies that show that that predict that up to 77 percent of cybersecurity budgets will be for outside assistance within the next few years. So absolutely. That is the trend that we are seeing. And it makes a lot of sense. Thank you, Sherry and Matt, for answering those questions and for your presentation.